Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the ACLU and to the Georgia Center for the Book for the kind invitation tonight. What I hope to do in the roughly 40 minutes uh, in which I'll be talking before answering questions, and if anyone is kind enough to purchase the book, signing it outside, is to introduce you to these two clients, Brandon Mayfield and Adel Hassan Hamad, and to introduce you briefly to some of the issues that have emerged in the representation that my office and I have provided to them. Issues that, as I see it, are of fundamental importance to all of us, all of us citizens of this great country and all of us as citizens of the world, because they're issues that can affect and do affect the freedoms that we enjoy. So let me start by taking you back. First, taking you back to March of 2006. March 3rd, 2006, I stepped off a little two-engine needle-nosed plane onto the tarmac at the United States Naval Station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I was armed with a security clearance provided by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and a theater clearance provided by the Department of Defense because I was there to see one of the seven men my office was representing, men who were being kept in Guantanamo Bay in the prison in our naval station there, euphemistically called enemy combatants, euphemistically said to be detained. They were in prison, and they were prisoners. I was met by a escort from the military, as they were called, and taken to the combined bachelor quarters, which is the place on the leeward side of the naval station in Guantanamo, where we habeas corpus lawyers spend our nights when we're there visiting our clients in the prison. I was there that day to see Adel Hassan Hama. When I went down there, I knew virtually nothing about him. Our government had not even told me that he was from Sudan and that his native language was Arabic until the very week that I got on into the airplane in Portland for the flight down to Cuba. And our government would tell me nothing about why they said he was being detained as an enemy combatant. They refused to provide us any information. The only information, if you can call it that, that I had when I went down there were the public statements by our president, our vice president, our secretary of defense, and other high governmental officials. And those statements proclaimed that all of the men in Guantanamo Bay were hardened fighters for al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That all of the men in Guantanamo Bay had been picked up on the battlefields in Afghanistan. And that all of the men in Guantanamo Bay were fighters who had taken action against the United States or our allies. The reality, as I have learned throughout my representation of Otto and the other men, is quite different. Now, throughout my life, I have read from time to time in the newspapers and heard on TV and the radio that some of our top governmental officials have actually lied to us, the American public. And when I read that in the media, I sometimes believe it, never very pleased to hear such things, and also receive them with some degree of skepticism. But in this instance, I can say to you today, based on the work that I have done and the information that has come to light from our government itself, that those statements by our top leaders are just not true. Because the Department of Defense was eventually required to release information about the prisoners. And some professors at Seton Hall Law School in New Jersey compiled a report based on the Department of Defense's own information. And that report showed that only 8%, only 8% of the men who've ever been in Guantanamo, who've ever been in the prison there, were actually fighters for al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That fewer than 5%, one out of 20, were actually picked up on the battlefields in Afghanistan. And fewer than 50% of the men who have ever been 
held in the prison in Guantanamo, have even been accused. And for the lawyers who are in the audience, I use the word accused very loosely because the accusations that exist in these Guantanamo Bay cases bear absolutely no relationship to any accusation that any lawyer has ever seen in an American court. But fewer than 50% have even been accused of committing any hostile acts against the United States or our allies. Now, when that report was released, our government was not amused and commissioned a group of professors at West Point to tell us all the truth. The West Point people issued a report as well. And to be sure, the numbers in the West Point study are somewhat higher than the numbers in the Seton Hall study. With respect to whether or not people were ever members of Al-Qaeda, the West Point people say, well, maybe a third, not three quarters, not a half, maybe a third were actually members of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or other such forces. And the West Point study said that 53% were accused of committing hostile acts. Barely more than half. And that's from the West Point study. Now, when I went down there that first day to see Adel Hassan Hamad, not knowing anything about him, I must say that it didn't really matter to me because I was going down there to represent him but I was also going down there to represent a process and to represent the rule of law and to argue that the men who were held in Guantanamo Bay had a right to some meaningful process. That our government had an obligation if it wanted to keep these men in prison to show to some at least semi-neutral finder of fact that there was a basis for doing so. And our government had refused to do that and our government had refused to allow those men to have any day in court. After spending the night in the combined bachelor quarters, this funky little hotel looks like a college dorm that's on the leeward side of the base. We get up the next morning, take the ferry across to the windward side of the base, the main part of the base. Met by a military escort as we got off the ferry, on a bus, given badges, and driven through a town that could have been anywhere in the southwestern part of the United States. I thought that I was going to Cuba, a tropical paradise in the Caribbean. Well, it turns out that the naval station in Guantanamo Bay is in a dry part of Cuba, and the predominant vegetation is a sort of scrubby-looking cactus. You go through a town that has a McDonald's, that has a Subway, that has a KFC, and for those of us from the Northwest, it warmed our hearts to see a Starbucks. You go past subdivisions with very appealing names like Sunrise Terrace and Iguana Terrace. And you go past a sign on the road that you take to get out to the prison that says $10,000 fine if you run over an iguana. And we habeas corpus lawyers viewed that sign with more than a small degree of irony because it seemed to us as though our government was providing more protection to the iguanas than it was providing to our clients. Eventually, you take another turn in the road and you see off in the distance the chain link fencing and razor wire of what was then the main part of the prison, Camp Delta. And sitting off behind that fenced enclosure, once again, you see the beautiful blue waters of the Caribbean. You take a left turn at Camp Delta, and on the left at that time in early March of 2006, two brand new concrete and steel structures were going up. Standard issue federal prisons. Today, it's in those prisons that the men in Guantanamo, virtually all of them, are housed. Housed in solitary confinement and housed locked down 22 hours per day. But back then, you go past Camp Delta, you take another right-hand turn, and you go up to Camp Echo, another fenced enclosure, the place where all of the visits took place in early March of 2006. I was there that morning with Assistant Defender Pat Ehlers, who was working with me on Adel Hassan Hamad's case. Also with me from my office were Senior Assistant Defenders Chris Schatz and Brian Leslie, 
we were going to visit one of our Afghan clients. We had an Arabic interpreter, they had a Pashto interpreter. There were also other lawyers who were there with us because the cases involving these men had actually begun back in 2002. Most of the men are represented by lawyers and private practice who are doing this work pro bono, out of their pockets. Center for Constitutional Rights, a private nonprofit in New York City, has been coordinating all the lawyer work since the first cases were filed in 2002. We got into the enclosure finally onto the inside, took a path to the left, and walked past one of several roughly 20 by 40 foot wooden structures that ring the interior of Camp Echo. Each structure has two doors on the front, each door is numbered. Our guard was taking us to door number 12. The door opened, we looked in, and the first thing that we saw was a little folding table. Behind the folding table was a little folding chair. Seated in that folding chair was a very dark-skinned black man. And I was somewhat surprised, because I thought that I was going to see an Arab. And perhaps this is my inherent racism, but I thought that Arabs were generally going to be relatively light-skinned people. I've since learned a great deal about Sudan, and that Sudan, like the United States, is a melting pot. The self-definition of the Sudanese Arabs ranges from the darkest black skin that one would find anywhere in Africa to the lightest blonde that one would find anywhere in Northern Europe. Adel Hassan Hamad sitting there in the chair wearing white pants, a white shirt, and a white kufi. He's a Muslim. And then I looked down, and I saw an eye hook drilled into the floor underneath the table, and a chain coming up from that eye hook to a manacle on his leg. For the two days of that first visit with Adel, and for the days of all the visits that I had with him and with our other clients, and for the days that each of the lawyers in my offices had with all of the clients we represent there, our clients sit chained to the floor. In my eyes, chained to the floor like a dog. That first two-day visit with Otto was an incredibly intense and emotional time. When we got there, we were the first people he had seen other than United States government interrogators and men and women in uniform for more than three and one half years. We had a lot that we had to cover, and the very first thing that we had to do was to overcome the distrust. There was absolutely no reason for him to trust us. After all, I'm coming in saying, I'm a lawyer, Otto, I'm representing you. But he knew that one of the ploys that the American military and FBI and other interrogators had used with the men in Guantanamo was to come in and pretend to be their lawyers, sowing distrust. I'm Jewish. And one of the things that the men there had been told was that those Jew lawyers who were coming down are going to sell you Muslims out. And I had another hurdle to overcome because I work for the federal government. So here I am coming in. Well, Adel, I'm from the Federal Defender's Office in Oregon. Well, there aren't a lot of Americans who necessarily understand that the Federal Defender's Office isn't part of the Department of Justice, that we're actually an independent entity of lawyers representing people. How on earth do you explain that to a Sudanese through an Arabic translator? But we talked. We listened. He talked. He asked questions. And we heard his story. The story of having been born in Sudan, raised in Sudan, having gone to college in Egypt, having gone back to Sudan in the early 80s, working in air conditioning because he'd gotten a degree in engineering. But it wasn't what he wanted to do with his life. Fortunate, he felt, to get a job with a charity that was helping the refugees of what were then the Afghan-Soviet wars. So he went to Afghanistan and to Pakistan fed refugees, taught refugees, clothed refugees, became an administrator for one of the charities. 
then became an administrator for another charity and ended up as an administrator of a hospital in Chamkanai, Afghanistan. Now I'm listening to all this and it has the ring of truth. But there's no reason for me to believe it other than an instinctual feel that this man is telling me the truth. But as a lawyer representing people charged with crimes, having tried my first case now more than 35 years ago, the unfortunate reality is that on day one, clients will on occasion say, I'm innocent. But on day two or day 20 or day 200, they sing a slightly different and more realistic tune. And that time was particularly intense and difficult because the men in Guantanamo have had no process. All my other clients, including the death row clients I represent now in Oregon, have been through a process. There's been a man or a woman in a black robe. There's been a set of rules that they can understand, at least on some level. And even if they're facing execution, there is some finality to what it is that they are facing. But in Guantanamo, there is none. There is no process. There is no finality. They are being held there, and they're being told they're held there indefinitely. Now, our government leaders don't use this word, but at the whim of our government. And they know that. To give you some idea of what those visits are like. I want to read you a paragraph from the book. It describes the end of the first visit that Pat and I had with Bobby. It was difficult when Pat and I had to leave at the end of the second day of our visit. Pat and I were about to go back to the larger world, but Otto was headed back to the loneliness of Camp Delta. Pat said his goodbye and shook Otto's hand. I said goodbye in English and Arabic, salam aleichem, and shook Adel's hand. I turned to get my papers, but before I could pick them up, Adel asked, when will I go home? We can only promise that we will fight for you in every way we can, I told him. Adel's eyes, which had been so calm for most of the meeting, started to darken. He reached out again and took my right hand, at first with his right hand, but then with both. Tears welled up in his eyes. He could see the ray of hope that had entered the cell with us beginning to die with our leaving. I put my left hand over our joint hands and we stood there looking at each other. There was no sound in the cell. I'm not sure anyone was even breathing. It was after getting on the plane after the second visit two months later that this book just started literally pouring out of me. I am a lawyer. I write a lot, but I write very dry legal briefs. Never wanted to be a writer of, of any anything else. But the book emerged. It emerged from the power, the emotional power and intensity of those meetings. But I'm going to leave Otto sitting there in that cell, chained to the floor for a moment, and I'm going to shift gears, and I'm going to take you back another two years. I'm going to take you back now to March 11 of 2004. Some of you may recall that on that day, bombs exploded at seven train stations in and around Madrid, Spain. 191 people were killed, and more than 2,000 people were injured. Among the dead were three Americans. The Spanish National Police were on the job immediately, and they were able to lift a latent fingerprint from a blue bag that they found in a kangoo van that was parked near the Aljaneras train station outside of Madrid. And inside that blue bag were unexploded detonators. The Spanish ran that fingerprint through their database and came up with nothing, so they sent it out electronically through Interpol to law enforcement agencies around the world, including our FBI. Within a week, the FBI said to the Spanish, we have your man, Brandon Mayfield, born in Oregon, raised in Kansas, raised as a Christian, 
married an Egyptian woman and converted to Islam. After declaring a match, the FBI went to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in Washington, D.C., and they obtained authorization from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court for electronic eavesdropping on Brandon's home and law office. They obtained permission from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court under the amendments through the Patriot Act to engage in sneak and peek searches. Sneak and peek. The words mean exactly what they mean in normal parlance. In the normal criminal case, you go to the court, you get authorization for a search, you have to knock and announce. Hello, guy, I'm here, I want to search for evidence. Well, if it's dangerous, the court will allow you to go in without knocking. And in some circumstances, you can actually delay giving notice for maybe 30 days that you've been there. But the sneak and peek searches are different because you don't have to announce, ever. You go in, you look around, you do your thing, and you leave. On April 8th, Mona Mayfield, Brandon's wife, came home from work. Mona works as Brandon's law office manager. She put the key into the lock in the front door and turned it, but the door wouldn't open. Someone had thrown a deadbolt that they never use. She went around to the side, went in a side entrance, and saw that someone had monkeyed with the electricity. All of the digital clocks were flashing. She called Brandon. Brandon, did you come home from lunch today and I didn't know about it? No. That night when the kids came home, kids, did any of you cut school today? No, no, Ma, no, Dad, no, we haven't been here. Well, it sure looked like someone had been in the home, but they, you know, nothing was taken. They didn't really know. A week later, Mona came home and it happened again. This time when she got inside, she saw a footprint in a deep white pile of carpet where she knew that there just shouldn't be one because she very specifically remembered having vacuumed after everyone else was out of the house. That night there was consternation in the Mayfield home. There was also terror. Terror can come in many shapes and sizes and forms, and that night it came to the Mayfield home. They didn't know it but it came to the Mayfield home as a result of the actions of our government. May 5, an email went between the Los Angeles and Portland FBI field offices. Anyone who buys the book will find that the publisher was kind enough to put some photographs in it. One of the photographs is this email. And the email says, we're worried that Brandon Mayfield is about to be outed in the media as the person whose fingerprint has been identified. Of course, no one really knew publicly that that had happened, but somehow word is leaking out. And we don't have enough probable cause to arrest him, this email says. So we'll hatch a plan. It's right there in black and white. If he's actually going to be outed by the media, we'll pull this material witness statute off the shelf. We'll arrest him as a material witness and then hold him, hoping we can get enough evidence to charge him. Now, eventually, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice did an investigation of the Mayfield matter, and one of the things that it looked into was the abuse of the material witness statute, which is not intended to be used to detain people when you can't charge them. It's to be used when you actually think that someone has evidence and they'll run away and not give it to you voluntarily. May 6th, Brandon was sitting in his law office. There was a knock at the door. It was two FBI agents. That afternoon, Brandon made his first appearance in the federal court in downtown Portland. He made that appearance with a friend of his, a mentor, an older lawyer, Tom Nelson, a civil lawyer. Tom realized very quickly that this was not his area of expertise because he looked at the papers, and he saw the papers said that Brandon was wanted in connection with these bombings. And that if he were charged, he could be prosecuted for a capital offense. The federal government has the death penalty and asserts jurisdiction over the deaths of American citizens overseas in terrorist acts. It's also far beyond the means of a young lawyer to retain an attorney for a case of that magnitude. Judge Jones called my office. The following morning, Senior Assistant Defender Chris Schatz and I went into the Multnomah County Jail for our first meeting with Brandon. 
Brandon had told the judge, not my print. Brandon had told the judge, I'm not involved. Brandon had told the judge, I'm not going anywhere, judge. And Brandon had been detained in the county jail. And here we get the first loop back from this domestic case to Guantanamo. I want to read you a paragraph from the book that describes the first meeting that Chris and I had with Brandon where we had to talk about Guantanamo. Some of the names that you'll hear in this paragraph are Hamdi and Padilla. Jose Padilla, United States citizen, arrested at the Chicago airport shortly after September 11. And headlines trumpeted the fact that he was arrested because something to do with a dirty radioactive bomb plot that he was engaged in. Jose Padilla was scheduled to have an appearance in the federal court in Chicago. The very morning, the judge sitting in the black robe on the bench and his lawyer waiting there for him, our government took him out of the federal system, put him into a military brig where he was held incommunicado for virtually three and a half years before he was eventually charged with a crime in federal court that had absolutely nothing to do with anything involving a radioactive bomb. The other name, Yasser Hamdi, American citizen picked up on the battlefield in Afghanistan, brought to this country, put into a military rig, not charged with treason, not charged with waging war against the United States, not charged with any of the offenses that are available in the U.S. Code, just held incommunicado without charges or trial. It was tough to talk to Brandon about the possibility of a death penalty charge. It's like a doctor telling a patient with what he thinks is a routine stomach ache that he has pancreatic cancer. While the death penalty hovered over all of our discussions, as long as Brandon was a witness, it remained somewhere off in the distance, but more immediate. And even more difficult to talk about was the possibility that we might not ever get to see Brandon again, a possibility made real by the policies of the Bush administration. On April 20 and 28, less than two weeks before Brandon's arrest, Solicitor General Ted Olson and his chief deputy, Paul Clement, had argued to the Supreme Court on behalf of the president and his administration that the president had the power to take or order anyone, including United States citizens arrested in the United States, out of the federal court system and hold them indefinitely in military detention without charges or trial. Footnote 15. If anyone buys the book, you'll see that there are 500 some odd notes. You can look it up. Google is a wonderful tool. You can look it up even if you don't buy the book. The arguments are there online. The briefs are there online. Every single time the Bush administration has told the Supreme Court that he has unlimited power to seize and detain and the courts cannot intervene, it's there for all of us to read. I told Brandon about the argument and that it's possible you won't be here tomorrow. In light of the administration's stance, I had to add, Brandon, this is real. They've actually done it. Hamdi and Padilla are in the naval brig. Trained in the law and believing in American justice, Brandon could not accept what I had said. But I am a United States citizen. So are they. It doesn't matter. His voice rising, he barked back, I'm a lawyer. See, that would protect him. I have cases pending in the federal court next door. I understand, Brandon. This is the new reality we have to deal with. Two weeks later, the Spanish told the United States government that they had identified the fingerprint as belonging to an Algerian named Daoud. The Spanish told our government that its report to them and to the federal court that three senior FBI examiners had identified this print with 100% certainty. The language in the court papers was in fact 100% wrong. Now to their credit, the US attorney and the head of the FBI in Portland, Oregon moved for Brandon's release the very next day. 
to their discredit. Top officials of the FBI and the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. sang a very different tune. The week after Brandon's release, I received a phone call from a staffer on the House side up on the Hill. Mr. Wax, she said, these top officials of the FBI have been in here and they've been telling us this mistake was made because they were working from a bad copy of the partial print. I said, no, I have the print in my office. The court had ordered the government to provide it to us after quite a bit of wrangling. And it's not a partial and it's not a bad copy. Two weeks later, then Attorney General Ashcroft himself testified under oath before a Senate committee, raised his right hand, swore to tell the truth. And he was asked, tell us about the Mayfield matter. And in talking about the Mayfield matter, among other things, he said, oh, guys, don't worry. This mistake was made because we were working from a, you guessed it, bad copy of a partial print. And with all respect that is due to the former Attorney General, that statement was not true. But I say to you, you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the word, and I feel a little bit silly saying this, from the federal government itself. Because the FBI convened an international panel of experts to look into the fingerprint matter. And that international panel of experts issued a report in November of 2004, footnoted in the book, available through Google, that said there was absolutely nothing wrong with that fingerprint. They said the mistake was made entirely as a result of what they called operator error. And they defined the operator error as falling in two different areas. One, they called confirmation bias. And by that, they meant abandonment of the scientific method. First FBI examiner looks at it and says, oh, this looks like a match to me. And instead of having an independent second test, any scientists in the room know you always have to do a second blind test, not knowing the results of the first. That's not what they did. In essence, it was, hey, Harry, come on over. Look, I think I got a match. Oh, yeah, Joe, that looks like a match to me. Sam, come on over. Three 30-year men, each confirming what the other had done. The second thing they said, I think, has even broader application to this war on terror, as it's called, more generally. Because they said what happened here is that the FBI succumbed to the pressures of trying to solve a big case. Now, there's no question, as I see it, that our law enforcement officers and our top government officials have a very weighty responsibility to try to keep us safe from acts of terrorism, prevent acts of terrorism, and solve acts of terrorism. It is not easy. There are bad guys out there. They have done bad things to us. They have done bad things elsewhere in the world. And undoubtedly, they would like to do so again. But what this international panel said is that in their zeal to solve this big case, they lost perspective. Their judgment got clouded. That they started seeing only that which was consistent with their preconceived views of the situation. If something didn't fit into their analysis, just ignore it. And I think that that's part of what we have seen happening in our government in many aspects of this war on terror. One of the clearest indications of that in the Mayfield case is the fact that when the Spanish said in mid-May, this isn't Brandon's print, it was not the first time they had told us that. On April 13, three full weeks before Brandon's arrest, the Spanish had sent a letter to our government telling them their analysis of the print as Brandon's was negative. And just to be sure there was no confusion, they bolded the word negative in the letter. It's in the book. It's online. See it for yourself. Brandon's case became a symbol nationally of some of the excesses in the war on terror, some of the abuses of the Patriot Act, of the material witness statute, of racial profiling, 
because in the search warrant and arrest warrant affidavits that were filed in the federal court, they led with this 100% certain fingerprint identification, but they didn't stop there. In offering other reasons why Brandon should be arrested and why searches of his home and law office were justified, they went on to say after the fingerprint paragraph, he's a Muslim. He has been seen attending a mosque, was in another separate paragraph. He's married to an Egyptian. And then in another paragraph, he's a lawyer, he said. Probable cause, because he's a lawyer. And the next paragraph said, he represented a man who has been convicted of a terrorism offense. My office's involvement in the war on terror began as early as October of 2001. And we've had a series of prosecutions in our great state that have been ongoing ever since. One resulted in a number of convictions. Some men from Portland who tried to get into the war in Afghanistan and fight with the Taliban against the Northern Alliance. Brandon ended representing one of those men in a child custody battle. That was in the affidavit as justification for his arrest and the searches. And I think most disturbing to me was the next paragraph, which gave in excruciating detail the anti-American and anti-Semitic views of Brandon's client as justification for his arrest. Now, in my 35 years, I've represented a fair number of people whose views I don't necessarily agree with. But here it was, the views of a lawyer's client being used to justify intrusion into his home and his incarceration. Brandon sued the government, not through my office, because we only do criminal work and habeas corpus work, but through civil lawyers. Our government ended up blinking and paid a very handsome monetary settlement, allowed his portion of the suit that sought an injunction against any future use of the sneak and peek provisions of the Patriot Act to go forward. And last September, District Judge Ann Aiken in Eugene, Oregon, issued a very nice opinion declaring two portions of the Patriot Act unconstitutional. A nice opinion describing the balance that was set 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago, between security and freedom in our country and reminding us we don't need to give up our freedom in order to be secure. So let's go back to Adel. Let's go back to Adel sitting chained to the floor in that cell in Guantanamo. When Pat and I left the prison, we had to give our notes to the government, unlike any other situation that a lawyer has where you have confidentiality in your communications with your client, in Guantanamo, if you want to use your notes, take them out of the classified zone, take them out of what's called the secure facility that sits in Crystal City, Virginia, across the street from the Pentagon, you have to let the government censors read them. And we did, because we wanted to investigate what he had told us, because as I said, I didn't know if it was true or not, and our government hadn't told me anything about it. A month later, the notes came back. We called the phone number that we had, a phone number of poor Adel's brother-in-law, also named Adel, Adel al tayeb the man who had been taking care of his wife and daughters while Adel had been in prison. We got information from him. We spoke with his wife. We spoke with his older daughters. We were able to track down by phone the doctor who had been the head of the hospital in Chomkinai, Afghanistan, when Adel had been the administrator. We were able to do the same thing for three of our other clients. And in the summer of 2006, I sent a team of lawyers and investigators into the war zone in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we found the witnesses for Adel and for the other clients. Sent another team to the United Arab Emirates. Came back with scores of hours of videotaped sworn statements attesting to the innocence, verifying virtually every detail of the account that Adel had given us. And what do we do with it? We're lawyers. We're supposed to present it to a court. Look, court, here's evidence. My client's innocent. But we couldn't because the Bush administration from 2002 on, had been arguing to the Supreme Court that the writ of habeas corpus did not extend to Guantanamo, and the men there had absolutely no rights, and they had won. They won in the lower courts until 2004, when the Supreme Court, for the first of three times, said to the administration, you're wrong. 
These men have the right to habeas corpus review. Habeas corpus review, meaning the judiciary looks at the president's actions, the president being not above the law, and gets to say, is this detention justified or not, legal or not? They said that for the first time, June of 2004. What did the administration do? Got together with its friends in Congress, and there's plenty of blame if you view this as a situation with blame to go around. Congress and the administration passed the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, stripping by statute any habeas corpus review, telling the federal courts, you cannot look into the president's actions. He is above the law. June of 2006, the cases get back to the Supreme Court for the second time. The Supreme Court says for the second time, Mr. President, that's not the American way. These men have a right to judicial review. So during the summer of 2006, while the team from my office was in Afghanistan and Pakistan and the United Arab Emirates, the administration and Congress get together again, and they pass the Military Commissions Act of 2006, once again stripping jurisdiction. But I'm a defense attorney. Defense attorneys are used to being told no. We're used to pushing forward when there's a stone wall against us and we just keep hitting it and occasionally it cracks. So we gave all our evidence to the courts and said, you got to look at this anyway. These men are innocent. Sorry for the blind monkeys. So I sent all the information to the U.S. military. U.S. military, look, you've got some innocent people there. Here's the evidence that you didn't ever bother going to investigate on your own. I don't get any formal reply. Although there's an interesting story about it that I tell in the book in terms of a cell phone number that was mistakenly, perhaps, sent to me that led me to some very interesting conversations. So one of the young Turks in the office says to me, Steve, let's go to the court of public opinion. Sure, Pat, why not? So we participated in a press conference that the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York was having, and we told the world the story of innocence of our clients, and they continued to rot in prison. So the young Turks come back and say, Steve, let's go to YouTube. And I said, what's that? <laughs> the fall of 2006, I admit, I'd never heard of YouTube. I now know what it is. So the office put together a little video Guantanamo unclassified. And we put it up on YouTube. And it rose to the number one spot on the political chart. Now, we didn't get as many viewers as some of these idiots who go diving in mud or whatever else gets put on YouTube. But we made it number one in the political section. And our clients rotted in prison. So Pat says to me, Steve, you know, if you make six phone calls, you're going to get to someone very famous and very important. Okay, Pat, start calling. So he calls one, who calls two, who calls three. And on the fourth call, Pat is speaking with Frida Mock. She's an Academy Award-winning documentarian in Hollywood who has progressive views. Frida says, this sounds like something very interesting. You know, I've got a very good friend who's a real president. And she called Martin Sheen, the president of the West Wing. <laughs> and Martin Sheen and Frida Mock made a portion of a video for us, free of charge, Guantanamo waiting for justice. We put that out on YouTube, and our clients brought it. Believing in pushing every possible lever through a strange family connection, my sister's husband's old friend working for the Carter Center, Larry, he's here tonight. Larry and I talk. I try to get the Carter Center involved. You have to push buttons. And the Carter Center was involved in helping a Moroccan at the time. And they get a little bit involved for us. And our client rots in prison. So we go to Sudan. I went to Sudan with William Teasdale, an investigator, an attorney in my office. We went to conduct more investigation, and we went to talk to the Sudanese government ministers. For their own geopolitical reasons, these men who are, at least our media says, running the war in Darfur and the horrors there, opened their offices to us. 
and I met with the Justice Minister of Sudan and the State Minister and the entire Human Rights Committee of the National Assembly and the leaders of the National Assembly and on and on and on and on. And we gave them the evidence of innocence that we had gathered. And they said, Mr. Wax, we know about Adel Hassan Hamad. We've seen him on YouTube. <laughs> it is a wonderful world that we live in. What would you like us to do? Now, I was there shortly after the Passover Seder of 2007. My friend Peter Korn and I both ended up inheriting old Reconstructionist Haggadahs, which are very political and not terribly religious. And I love the political content of it. And I love reading at the Passover Seder when Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. So I say to the leaders of the Islamic Republic of Sudan, in the Seder, Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. Look across the ocean. We don't call him Pharaoh. But just say, let my people go. And the day after we left Sudan, the foreign minister, Lame Cole, wrote to Secretary of State Rice a letter and said, let our people go from Guantanamo. We'd like to start negotiating with you. And in particular, in the last paragraph, he said, we've seen the evidence of innocence of Adel Hassan Hamad. There is no basis to hold him. Let him come home. Several months later, the state minister came and visited Deputy Secretary of State Negroponte. And over the summer and fall, our governments negotiated. The leaders of the U.S., the leaders of Sudan, talked about Darfur, they talked about Guantanamo generally, and they talked about Adel Hassan Hamad. And on December 12, he was blindfolded, earmuffed, muzzled, and chained for the last time for the flight home to Sudan with the enemy combatant designation intact. Reunited with his family, the Sudanese brought him home that morning. I've spoken with him regularly since, and he says to me, Steve, I want justice. I want my name cleared. And so my fight for him continues. Our three Afghan clients are home with their families. We have three clients who are still in the prison in Guantanamo and our fight for them goes on. In June of this year, the Supreme Court spoke for the third time on the Guantanamo cases, and it spoke in an opinion that I urge everyone in this room to read, written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, not just for the lawyers, but written for the entire population of this great land of ours, written in lay terms in many places, and written with an eye toward history and future history. Justice Kennedy took us all back to Runnymede. And anytime anyone has taken you back to Runnymede, I love it. Because I have the image of King John sitting out there on his horse on the field. The barons are surrounding him, and the barons are saying, Johnny boy, you know, the divine right of kings, it's passe. You don't have it all anymore. Here's the great charter. We have some rights, too. And Kennedy, and I'm channeling Justice Kennedy now, Kennedy took us all, in this opinion, from Magna Carta into the 1600s, talked about an overseas war that was being run by, it was then a king that was unpopular, but that king understood that if you're going to have a war, you need to tax, otherwise you bankrupt your country. And King Charles imposed a tax, but he did it in an unorthodox way. And Justice Kennedy tells us that five of his knights were not happy, didn't want to ante up, and he threw them in the tower. Those knights said, Charles, you can't do this. We have a right to habeas corpus. We have a right to have the English judges look at the legality of our imprisonment. Charles wasn't happy. 1628, the parliament issues what's called the petition of right, because this battle is still going on, that says, you know, those knights are right. They have a right to petition. Charles not happy. He disbanded the parliament, Justice Kennedy tells us. 11 years, no parliament in England. Kennedy takes us up to 1640. Parliament is reconvened, and one of the first things it does is pass a habeas corpus act. Charles is not amused. Charles and Parliament get into a fight. The English civil wars begin. Charles literally loses his head. Cromwell comes in. Those historians in the room remember the English civil wars, Cromwell, 
the terrors that took place there. Finally, in the 1670s, things are calming down. Parliament is back in session with more power. And in 1679, Justice Kennedy tells us the Habeas Corpus Act that exists to this day in England is passed, ensuring what has been called the most important tool against tyranny for the English. And Justice Kennedy goes on to tell us that that writ of habeas corpus was imported into this country, not in the Bill of Rights, but in the body of the Constitution itself. It was so fundamental and so important. And Justice Kennedy tells us that the presidents in this country do not have the power that was stripped from the English kings more than 400 years ago. It is very important to note that that decision was five to four. Four of the justices would have said to the president that he did have the authority to act unilaterally to indefinitely detain people without any charges or trial. Five to four. And while this is certainly not a political talk, it is a fact that after that opinion was handed down, one of the presidential candidates said that that opinion of Justice Kennedy's was absolutely right and critical and important to the structure and functioning of our government. And one of the presidential candidates said that it was an abomination. It sided with the dissenters who said that the majority would have blood on its hands. You can look up to see which candidate said which. So the fight goes on. We now have access to the courts, although the government says that our right to hearings is minuscule and we say it's broader and no one has yet had a habeas hearing four months or more after that decision. And I don't know if anyone ever will have a habeas hearing, but we're fighting. So let me sum it up and then take a couple questions. And I'll sum it up in this way. I don't pretend to be an expert in international terrorism. I don't pretend to ever have sat in the White House or the Vice President's office or been there while they're making some of the very difficult decisions that they have had to make. I do know a few things. As I said, I do know from my personal observation, not from reading it in the media, that both in the Mayfield matter and in the Guantanamo area, our top government officials were not truthful with us. I've seen it. I've seen the evidence. I'm not relying on anyone else to tell me that. That's very disturbing to me. And I think it should be disturbing to all of us. I know a number of things that are very personal. I know that Adel Hassan Haman, this black Muslim, Sudanese, desert man, and I, a white, Jewish, American lawyer, touched and met on a very basic and fundamental human level. I know that we were able to see past what is on each of our surfaces. I know that we were able to see past what our respective governments told us we should see in the other one and just deal with our common humanity. And I believe that all of us have the potential to do that more often than I'm afraid we all often do. And I believe that if we all made that effort a little bit more, the world would indeed be a better place. And I know this. I wrote this book on my time, in the very early hours of the morning before I got up and went to work, and late at night after my wife was asleep and my kid was done with his homework. But the work that I do for Brandon and the work that I do for Otto, I do on your time, because I am a federal government employee paid with your tax dollars. 
So if you like the work that we do next April 15, you can pretend that you're paying for the salaries of the federal defenders throughout the country. You can even keep it local because you've got Matt Dodge here in the room, an assistant defender in the Atlanta office who is representing men in Guantanamo and has been in this fight for a number of years as well. And I don't know, Matt, if there are any other people from your office here, I don't want to leave them out. If you don't like what we do, you can vision, visualize your money going wherever you want it to go. But that's important to me because I don't think there are any other places in the world where the government would pay people such as Matt and me and the other federal defenders who are involved in these cases to fight it. Our government pays us to fight it on the most fundamental issues of the day. And it leaves us alone to do that fight as we believe it should be done. It leaves us alone to live our ideals, to try to live the Constitution. And whenever I get really angry at some of the warts and scars and other things that I see going on in my name by my government, I remember that my office and I function because of the government. And that, I think, is something in which we can all take pride as Americans. And it is a wonderful statement of the ongoing belief in liberty that does exist in this country. And it's what makes me proud to be an American. So let me stop there, take some questions if we have time, and then if anyone wants a copy of the book, I'm happy to sign it. Thank you.